after talking about the observations and measurements regarding climate change that we can observe uh, global warming within the last years and uh, uh, decades now we want to have a look at the physics uh, on earth uh, regarding the greenhouse effects uh, where does this uh, global warming come from uh, what are the reasons first step is that we take a look at the global mean radiation budget you can see on this uh, diagram with values taken from the ipcc uh, report of uh, 2013 um, all the values you can see are given watts per square meter and show the the energy balance uh, on earth on the left hand side you see the incoming radiation coming from the sun um, through the atmosphere and on the right hand side you can see the radiation uh, and the energy um, of the earth uh, due to uh, thermal radiation and finally uh, of course a very important issue the radiation uh, due to uh, greenhouse gases so the heat radiation we get which uh, lead to an increase of earth uh, surface temperature uh, to make uh, earth habitable so um, first of all, let's have a look at the incoming radiation, uh, in particular the value or the very first value of 340 watts per square meter. That's the radiation, the mean radiation in this simplified energy budget uh, diagram um, we, we get. So let's first have a look at where does this value come from. So we have the solar constant. So that's the radiation of the sun or the radiance that is 1367 watts per square meter um, modern measurements show that uh, this value is slightly small about 1361 watts per square meter um, and of course this value changes uh, as uh, the earth moves around the sun and uh, the angle of, of, of the earth is slightly changing so yeah, this value isn't constant and, and varies over uh, over time but let's let's take this value of 1367 watts per square meter um so this value um if we have earth on the right hand side so that's that's the that's earth of course uh we uh, or the, the, this the area which hits or hits the earth is just the radius or this the circle with the radius of, of earth so uh, what do we have is we have this uh, let's go call this d that's uh, just the the area of this uh, of the circle uh, p times uh, radius squared so that's the surface uh, or the area which is hit by the solar radiation but of course we have uh, a sphere um, and uh, the surface of the sphere is for P times r squared so that's the surface of earth which is receiving this radiation and you see uh, the ratio is just one quarter so in average um, over one year um, the mean uh, energy or the, the mean radiation we get is just one one quarter of this value of 1367 watts per square meter due to this ratio uh, of oh, one quarter so that gives us um, a mean radiation of 342 watts per square meter but to be more accurate and that are the the actual data uh, of the IP, uh, ipcc report is that this value is uh, at uh, 340 watts per square meter with an inaccuracy of uh, plus minus uh, one next um, what you see is uh, about 79 watts per square meter are absorbed in the in the atmosphere uh, so that is in the area the radiation which is uh, directly absorbed in in the, uh, the earth's atmosphere and um, what we have is about 100 watts per square meter are reflected and then toa means top of, of atmosphere so that is uh, happening in the upper parts of the atmosphere that 100 watts per square meter are reflected and um, cannot um, get uh, to the surface of, of earth so what we finally have is about 185 watts per square meter of the incoming solar radiation um, directing to the surface 
Uh, and then what we have is uh, we have a reflection on the surface um, of, of Earth, uh, of course, uh, which is varying. Uh, water has a different uh, albedo, so the capacity to, to reflect radiation uh, than ice or, or, or woods and forests. So uh, about or in, in average 24 watts per square meter are reflected. And finally, what we have is 161 watts per square meter uh, this radiation uh, is absorbed uh, by the surface and then uh, this this amount can uh, is, is also used to heat up the earth finally uh, what we see is of course that's an energy balance so uh, if we change one value we it takes some time until to, to, to get a new equilibrium uh, on the left hand side these values are uh, or this this 340 watts per square meter that's more or less constant there are no significant changes uh, of the solar radiation uh, although of course the solar radiation varies as the solar the activity of the sun is changing but these well the, the change or the variability is rather small so on the left hand side the incoming radiation is more or less constant um, with slight changes um, what we have is on the other hand, of course, uh, if we increase the concentration of greenhouse gases, uh, what does this mean? So we get more heat radiation coming from the greenhouse gases um, back on Earth. And this means, of course, more energy within this part of the atmosphere that the surface is getting warmer. The warmer the surface is, of course, the more heat radiation we get and to get a new equilibrium. What does it mean? The temperature of the atmosphere is increasing uh, step by step over time uh, until we get a, a new equilibrium. And if you want to cool down the atmosphere or Earth, what should you do? Of course, you should need to reduce the greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere, that we have uh, less concentration of these greenhouse gases in, this, in the atmosphere, in the upper part of the atmosphere. Um, that we reduce the heat radiation and that would uh, or the consequence would be that we could, would get a decrease of the temperature um, of course this has happened in the previous periods in the earth um, age of course we've had time periods with higher temperatures and even with, with smaller temperatures last ice age has been just four degrees celsius cooler than today of course, we have had time periods with the mean temperature, which has been about 10 degrees Celsius higher than today, with a total different uh, carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere. So, of course, we have had these changes in the past, but at the moment, these changes are very, very fast. Um, and uh, this leads to a uh, steady increase of the temperature over the last decades uh, that we uh, have uh, more or less a mirror uh, at the in, in the atmosphere which reflects the heat radiation back on Earth uh, and uh, the new equilibrium um, leads to an increase of this uh, of the temperature of Earth. To understand the heat radiation we need to talk about uh, Planck's law and Stefan, the Stefan Boltzmann law. So the Planck's law describes the spectral density of electromagnetic radiation which is emitted by a black body. Um, this black body must be or is in, in thermal equilibrium uh, at a given temperature and what you can then derive is uh, the, the, the radiation emitted by this black body. On the right hand side uh, you see uh, these uh, the characteristics uh, regarding the wavelength so we have three different uh, characteristics uh, of a black body with uh, at three different uh, temperatures, 3000, 4000 and 5000 uh, Kelvin. And uh, the y-axis shows the spectral radiance, so the power per square meter area and per uh, wavelength. And what you can clearly see is on the one hand that uh, the higher the temperature is, the uh, larger uh, the maximum is, and the, um, on the other hand, the higher the temperature, the smaller the, the peak of this of this characteristic is. So the higher the temperature, the smaller the wavelength of the or the maximum of this uh, emitted electromagnetic radiation is. Um, for a body, for example, with a, a temperature of five thousand Kelvin, you see that the maximum is um, at uh, let's say five hundred to six hundred. Uh, 
nanometers. So within the visible spectrum, uh, and the cooler the, the body is, for example, if the body has a temperature of 3000 kelvins, then the maximum is, or the slope of this curve uh, differs, uh, it's more flattened, and the maximum is uh, at higher wavelength, so in, in the region of infrared uh, radiation, so heat radiation. Um, what you can do is you can derive or use the Stefan Boltzmann law uh, to derive the total energy flow of a warm black body so you see this equation that the the energy flow so of course it's a power is uh the stefan boltzmann constant so 5.67 uh, times 10 to the minus 8 watts per square meter and uh, kelvin uh, to the fourth then you need the absolute temperature uh, given in kelvin of course uh, to the fourth and you need the emission area of the body so what is the the area uh, of this uh, of this black body, uh, of course you can um, use the total specific energy flow. So divide this energy flow by the emission areas, and then you get the, uh, this equation that the it's, uh, the energy flow, the specific energy flow, is uh, the Stefan Boltzmann constant times uh, the temperature to the fourth. And then you directly see the higher the temperature is, the larger the the, the energy flow is. Um, and of course, that's important uh, regarding uh, the greenhouse effect and to understand uh, what is uh, the consequence of uh, the greenhouse gases uh, on Earth uh, that the greenhouse gases lead to an increase of the of Earth's uh, surface temperature. Um, first of all, what we want to have is a look at the situation if Earth wouldn't have a surface in an idolized uh, a greenhouse model. How does this look like? So let's consider uh, the following situation in our idolized uh, greenhouse model. Um, we have the surface of, of Earth. Uh, then, of course, we have the solar radiation with the solar constant of 1,360 watts per square meter. Of course, you can also use one of the 1367 uh, the typical values but let's keep to the uh, values which are used in the current uh, IPCC report uh, of course that is uh, the total uh, radiation of the Sun and what we have to keep in mind is that just uh, one quarter uh, in, in average uh, can be used to heat up Earth so what we get is just one quarter so that is 340 watts per square meter on average, uh, which can be used to, uh, to heat up uh, this planet. Um, so think about there is no atmosphere, so no absorption, no reflection within the atmosphere. So this radiation uh, hits, hits, hits the surface. Uh, what we on one hand is we have a reflection of this radiation. Uh, due to the albedo, so the ability of the surface to reflect this electromagnetic uh, radiation back to, to into the universe, and that uh, reflection is about uh, 30%. So 30% of the of the of the radiation is directly reflected and it does not heat up our idolized Earth, so this black body. Um, so. Uh, we have an albedo, so the reflection um, is the albedo of Earth is uh, about 30%, um, and we can just use 70% uh, of uh, this radiation of this 340 watts per square meter um, to heat up our black body. And now we can, can use the uh, Stefan Boltzmann law, this equation, to derive what is the surface temperature because in a thermal equilibrium, uh, if uh, our black body Earth is uh, heated up with this uh, reduced radiation, uh, our black body heats up and we get a, a temperature. And we can derive this temperature T. This is uh, E dot S over sigma, and then this is uh, up to the uh, 1 over 4, uh, so the fourth square root. Um, of Es dot over uh, sigma, 
And what do we have is yes dot. This is our solar constant, 1360 watts per square meter time uh, 1 minus 0.3, so the albedo. We need to consider this, and of course, then we have 1 over 4. We've seen this, um, seen this in a uh, right before, before uh, that we are just one quarter uh, due to the radiation of the sun and this uh, and uh, the surface of Earth. So it's just, it's just one. What we get is for the temperature T, if we use all these values, and uh, in our Stefan Boltzmann law, um, is a value of uh, temperature of 200. 54.5 Kelvin uh, and this corresponds to a temperature of um, minus uh, 18.5 degrees Celsius. So very often what you find is uh, that the temperature is um, 255 Kelvin so that's about minus 18 degrees Celsius. Um, if you use uh, the solar constant 1367 watts per square meter, so you see even the, in this idealized model, um, small changes in the result, but I think you, you get the main point in this uh, idealized model um, that uh, the surface temperature of Earth would be below uh, zero degrees Celsius, so uh, we wouldn't have liquid water, uh, all the water would be ice, and Earth wouldn't be able to to inhabit um, life. Um, so that's the situation we have. Of course, that's an idealized situation as uh, the solar constant varies, uh, the albedo is not constant, that's all, all the values are averages over long time periods. And of course, um, you have to consider that uh, the uh, part of the Earth uh, heading to the Sun is heating up, and the part uh, on the back side, so during the night, would cool down. You can observe this on, on the Moon that the Moon side heading to the, the Sun is very, very hot, and the temperature on the back side of the Moon, so the dark side, uh, is very, very small. But in average, over one year, uh, you would get this uh, mean. Uh, temperature of, of minus 18 degrees Celsius on Earth under these uh, circumstances. Um, but of course, um, Earth has an atmosphere and we have the greenhouse effect. There are greenhouse gases and that is very important as the mean temperature of Earth. Uh, so the mean temperature is uh, 15 degrees Celsius. So it's uh, about um, 288 Kelvins. Um, so that's the, the situation we have. So there must be an additional energy flow uh, which results in an increase of this temperature of our idolized Earth, of this uh, idolized greenhouse model. Uh, and what we can do is we can derive uh, this additional energy flow uh, which comes from the greenhouse gases. So uh, let's, let's calculate this. What you want to know is what is this additional flow. Um, so what we have to consider is on the one hand we have our uh, energy flow of this mean temperature to the fourth minus our energy flow we have uh, in, in, in case of no atmosphere. So on this idolized uh, model so we have this, uh, this temperature T. Um, to the fourth, and that times our Stefan Boltzmann constant gives us our additional uh, energy flow. Um, let's call this F, Fg for the additional energy flow uh, due to uh, the greenhouse gases. And if you uh, use this values, what you get is that this Fg is about 150 watts per square meter. So there is an additional uh, um, radiation. So if we add this uh, to our diagram on the top, so uh, what we have is we have the temperature of uh, 15 degrees Celsius instead of minus 18 or minus 18.5. So what we can derive is what is the heat radiation due to the Planck's law uh, of this 
idolized black body of our idolized earth and of course uh, if we know this this uh, this radiation coming from this value of 15 uh, degrees celsius so this this larger value uh, we we see that there must be an additional radiation of 150 watts per square meter coming from from the atmosphere uh, to heat up uh, Earth in this idealized model um, to, to to get liquid water, and that's important that we have liquid water that the temperatures on on the surface of Earth is above fifteen degrees um, Celsius. And uh, you see, so this this value of one hundred fifty watts per square meter um, that or the, the reason for this are greenhouse gases. We know this from, from the planet Venus, which has a, also an atmosphere like Earth, uh, but uh, this atmosphere consists mainly of, of, of carbon dioxide, so one uh, greenhouse gas, and that leads to a very high temperature on the surface of Venus. Uh, on Earth, we have an uh, equilibrium, and uh, we get this temperature of 15 degrees Celsius, so the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere uh, lead to an uh, additional radi heat radiation uh, with one, about 150 watts per square meter which uh, heats up our uh, idolized earth. Of course in, in, in detail this is much more complicated as we have uh, the different temperature layers uh, in the atmosphere, um, the, the gaseous atmosphere is, is moving, uh, we have uh, weather effects, we have the clouds which are also reflecting radiation so of course uh, if you go into detail this is getting more complicated but this idealized model and the simplified model it helps you to understand uh, the, the, the values and the magnitude of the values and to see why the temperature of earth is above zero degrees celsius that is uh, that earth is habitable and uh, this uh, is very important uh, to understand and of course finally uh, if what is happening if this greenhouse gas concentration would increase um, of course then this value will increase we get more heat coming from this greenhouse gases and uh, this leads of course to an additional energy flow and an increase of this temperature this is what we are observing at the moment and of course what has happened in the uh, past history of earth if you take a look at the atmosphere and the molecules or the components we have in the atmosphere, uh, you can see uh, our atmosphere consists mainly of nitrogen, oxygen and argon. So you see on this left hand side these three bars. So 78% of our uh, atmosphere is nitrogen, then 21% is oxygen, then we have 0.9% argon, then we have trace gases uh, which contribute to the greenhouse effect. So uh, uh, the concentration is rather small. We've seen this in the previous video that the concentration of carbon dioxide, which is uh, the molecule with the highest concentration of these trace gases, um, uh, so carbon dioxide has a concentration of 407 ppm, so parts per million, so we have 1 million uh, molecules in the atmosphere and just 407 of these uh, molecules are carbon dioxide. What we then have is other trace gases like neon, helium and then we have methane with a concentration of 1.9 ppm and then again we have even uh, smaller concentrations like hydrogen with a concentration 500 ppb so parts per billion um, so uh, 1000 magnitudes smaller concentration we have nitrous oxide with a concentration of 310 ppb and then other uh, molecules like carbon monoxide and then finally also an important uh, greenhouse gas is ozone with a concentration of about 30 ppb in in average uh, so long-term average um, and of course it's a spatial average uh, of course, what you can think of, that the concentration of these gases is so small, can they really contribute uh, to the greenhouse effect? Of course they can do. Um, this uh, concentration is sufficient. What you can do is, or for example, that understand that uh, this concentration does not give any hint about the ability to, to contribute to the greenhouse effect is, for example, 
Um, if you think about uh, cyanide poisoning, that uh, if you have a concentration of cyanide uh, of, let's say, 150 to 200 ppm, so just one half of the concentration of carbon dioxide. So if, you're, if you would be in a room with uh, a with, uh, concentration of cyanide of uh, 200 ppm, this would be highly toxic and uh, lead to death within minutes. So you see that the concentration uh, does not give you direct, a direct hint uh, to the contribution to anything. So the concentration of these trace gases of the greenhouse gases is important uh, and sufficient 400 ppm is uh, a value which leads to the temperatures we are observing at the moment. Um, and finally, what you what you keep in mind, and that will we see we will see this uh, in shortly that. Only molecules with at least uh, three uh, atoms can contribute to the greenhouse effect. So nitrogen and oxygen cannot uh, or are not able to contribute to the uh, greenhouse effect. They cannot absorb and emit uh, heat radiation. Um, you need at least three molecules and you need a dipole moment which can vary. Um, and this is given uh, for carbon dioxide, for methane, nitrous oxide, and of course, uh, this is also water is, is able to uh, have a dipole moment and to change the dipole moment to, to absorb and to emit uh, heat radiation. And finally, the, the physical principles of these uh, greenhouse effect have been described in the past. So John Tyndall has described this effect in the mid of the 19th century. And Arrhenius was the first to, to describe the greenhouse effect in the 19th century. So this is well known, well understood, um, based on the uh, physical laws we, we know. Uh, so that's not, not new, it's well known and well understood why these molecules contribute uh, to the greenhouse effect. Before going into the details how these molecules contribute to the greenhouse effect, how they are able to uh, absorb and emit uh, heat radiation, let's have a quick look at the mean, mean greenhouse gases and their contribution. We have five main compounds. Uh, so we have water vapor uh, with the highest concentration, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide and ozone. Um, what you can see here in this column is the concentration in the atmosphere. Of course, the concentration varies heavily. You see the concentration of water vapor varies between 5 and even 10,000 uh, ppm. Uh, carbon dioxide, um, well, the average of the carbon dioxide concentration over one year is at the moment 407 ppm. So again, keep in mind, uh, this value varies uh, due to the seasons. And during summertime, this value is smaller in winter time. Uh, in the northern hemisphere, uh, this value is, is, is larger. Uh, so the annual mean concentration is 407. We have methane, 1.9 ppm, nitrous oxide, 0.3 ppm. And finally, ozone. Uh, the concentration of ozone in the atmosphere varies between 2 and 8 ppm. Again, um, it depends on the location. Uh, so we have a spatial distribution of ozone. And the contribution of these compounds, the greenhouse effects, mainly water vapor, uh, has a contribution between 36 and 73 percent. Again, depending on the concentration, uh, the higher the concentration is, the higher uh, the greenhouse effect is. Uh, the carbon dioxide concentration varies between 9 and uh, 26 percent. So if the concentration is large, we have a higher contribution and uh, during summertime in the northern hemisphere, the contribution is, is even smaller as the concentration is smaller. Methane has a contribution of 4 to 9 percent, nitrous oxide just 1 to 2 percent, um, and finally ozone 3 to 7 percent. And what you need to keep in mind is that this is the overall contribution. Um, the uh, contribution of a single molecule is, is even uh, or it differs significantly uh, if you define that the carbon dioxide contribution would be uh, normalized to one then the methane contribution would be uh, about 25 to 30 times larger um, so the, the greenhouse effect uh, the emission of uh, heat radiation of methane compared to uh, di carbon dioxide at the same concentration is 25 times larger 
and uh, even on nitrous oxide, so the contribution or the, the effect of nitrous oxide compared to carbon dioxide is, uh, let's say, 300 times larger. So that's important uh, that um, this contribution on the, in the last column shows you the overall contribution regarding the type of the compound and, of course, the concentration to the atmosphere. And you see mainly water vapor, which we cannot influence uh, by uh, human, by mankind directly, but what we can do is we can influence the carbon dioxide concentration as we increase the carbon dioxide by burning fossil fuels, uh, and we increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We increase the concentration, which leads to an increasing effect uh, of or the increasing greenhouse effect, and this leads, as we have seen this uh, before leads to an increase of, uh, of the surface temperature. To understand the contribution of molecules to the greenhouse effect, we want to have a look at the molecular vibrations of carbon dioxide um, to get heat radiation from the molecules. What they must be able to do is that they are able to absorb heat radiation, so uh, photons of the IR spectrum uh, and then that they can emit these IR photons again. And this is only possible for molecules which have at least three atoms. And we want to have a look at the molecular mechanical description of the movement of the vibration of these atoms. So let's take a look at carbon dioxide. You see the molecule on the upper left hand side in green, that's the carbon atom, and then in red the two oxygen atoms and the chemical bond between uh, the atoms is a double bond uh, represented by, this, uh, by these lines. Um, and to get an idea about the magnitude of these uh, vibrations of the wave number or of the wavelength of this vibration, uh, you can do or you can use a classical description. You do not need to use uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, you can derive the magnitude of the wave number uh, by just using molecular mechanics. And what do you do? You describe uh, the chemical bond between the atoms by using a spring. Um, so we have one spring between the uh, left uh, oxygen atom and the carbon atom, and then a second spring between the carbon atom and the uh, oxygen atom on the right hand side. Uh, the, the spring constant uh, has a magnitude of 1600 newtons per meter. Um, and this simplified model helps us to understand and to describe uh, the vibrations of this, uh, of this molecule. A consequence of this simplified model is that we will get two eigen vibrations uh, of this uh, molecule. Uh, of course, uh, carbon dioxide has in total four uh, vibrations. Um, uh, to get this from the classical model, uh, what we would need is we would need to add a, a third spring between both oxygen atoms. This is done in molecular mechanics. We will neglect this at this point to keep our model simple. Uh, but to get the result and to understand where the vibrations come from and why carbon dioxide contributes to the greenhouse effect. Uh, what we also need is, of course, the masses of uh, both atoms. So the mass of the carbon atom is uh, 1.99 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms, and the oxygen is slightly um, heavier with a mass of 2.66 times 10 to the minus 26 uh, kilograms coming from uh, the mass or the number of uh, uh, protons and uh, neutrons in the nucleus. And what you can do is, on the one end, of course, you can describe the forces um, in this in this model. So we have two springs, and you can describe uh, the stretching, or the forces due to stretching of these uh, of these springs. Uh, another way, of course, is use the uh, Lagrangian um, mechanics or dynamics that you uh, have a look at the kinetic energy and the potential energy within our system. So what you see is here the kinetic uh, energy. We have uh, three atoms which can we, we, which can move. So we have one half m times the velocity squared of each atom. So we have the uh, kinetic energy of the first oxygen atom, the kinetic energy of the carbon atom, and then we have the uh, third uh, term is the uh, kinetic energy of this of the second uh, oxygen atom. And then, additionally, we need the potential energy uh, within our system. 
uh, of course we have uh, two springs so uh, if we stretch this spring we can or we have a potential energy and this is described by uh, these two uh, terms so we have one half k so this uh, force constant times and then is uh, that's the distance between the the atoms uh, from the equilibrium uh, again squared so that's the term from uh, coming from the first spring and then this is the uh, term for the second spring. What I want to neglect and what you can do on your own is to figure out uh, the, um, the description of the movement uh, and that you get the, the equations of the movement, differential equations of course uh, you have to solve and then you get a matrix as this movement of course is coupled uh, and you have to, to derive the eigenvalues that is that are the wave numbers and the eigenvectors that are the description that is the description of the movements of the atoms um, on your own. Uh, I will neglect this and give you directly the result of uh, the solution of this description. If you solve these equations of movement, you can see the results on the right hand side. Uh, we have two uh, different movements uh, coming from our simplified model with these two uh, springs to represent the uh, chemical double bond. On the one hand, what we get is we get a symmetric stretch of our molecule that the carbon atom in the center does not move and both oxygen atoms move uh, symmetrically. So they move, um, get closer to the carbon atom and then they Go far away from the uh, from the so that's the movement that's the vibration of these uh, two oxygen atoms in this case that's called a symmetric stretch as the oxygen atoms um, vibrate uh, symmetrically. Um, this uh, what what you derive from this model is a calculated wave number of one thousand three hundred and three one per centimeter. Uh, the measured wave number from experiments is slightly larger with 1,388 uh, one uh, per square centimeter. But you see that our simplified uh, mechanical or classical mechanical model uh, gives us a very good result or approx uh, approximation of the, of the measurement uh, and helps us to understand what is happening. So you do not need to, to do quantum mechanics to derive the magnitude of order of our wave number. Um, what is important is that this vibration is IR inactive uh, as the, the dipole moment, which is uh, responsible, important for the uh, activity of molecules regarding uh, the greenhouse effect, uh, does not change. So, um, as uh, the, the carbon atom is slightly positively charged, the oxygen atoms uh, due to the electronegativity are slightly negatively charged. They grab uh, the, the electrons from the carbon atom. Uh, but in this symmetric stretch, uh, the, the overall um, dipole moment of this uh, molecule does not change. So this stretch cannot contribute uh, to the absorption and emission of uh, heat radiation. On the other hand, the second solution of the equations of movement is an asymmetric stretch. What you get is you get uh, that the carbon atom and one oxygen atom get closer to each other and on the other hand the second oxygen atom um, increases the distance of uh, the, to the carbon atom. So that's the asymmetric stretch of this, of this molecule that the carbon moves to the left hand side, the oxygen gets closer. Uh, and the other oxygen moves in the in the same direction and gets far away from uh, from the carbon atom. That's an asymmetric stretch. What you derive uh, from these uh, classical equations is that the wave number of this vibration is uh, two thousand four hundred ninety five one per centimeter. The measured wave number is slightly smaller, but again, you see that uh, our uh, model uh, based on molecular mechanics um, gets in the order of magnitude. So we can derive that this wave number, that that wave number lies within this um, infrared band. And um, we can understand that this, in, in this region, we, the carbon dioxide molecule is, is able to absorb and emit uh, heat radiation. Why is this um, uh, asymmetric stretch IR active? What you get is we get a change of the dipole moment. Again, you see the partial charges of carbon and the oxygen atoms. 
And due to this asymmetric stretch, we have a change of the total dipole moment. Um, if this bond is shortened and the, the bond between the second oxygen atom and the carbon atom is, is enlarged, we have a shift of the total dipole moment of the carbon, di of the di carbon dioxide molecule. Um, and that's um, necessary that this molecule is able to absorb uh, heat radiation um, and uh, emit heat radiation. So this asymmetric set gives us the IR activity of carbon dioxide. And uh, this helps us to understand that uh, the heat radiation coming from, from Earth uh, can be observed by carbon dioxide. We um, have these uh, vibrations. Uh, and um, after a while, uh, the carbon dioxide molecule can emit a photon in the uh, IR with the IR wave number or IR uh, wavelength, and then we get uh, heat radiation which is emitted in all directions, and in particular, of course, back to Earth, and that uh, heats up the Earth's surface. Now we've understood how heat radiation can be absorbed and emitted um, by molecules due to their vibrations and uh, now we want to have a look so how does the how do these molecules contribute uh, to the greenhouse effect and what you see on the left hand side uh, the two most important uh, molecules which are responsible for the greenhouse effect on the one hand we have uh, carbon dioxide and you see again the asymmetric stretch of carbon dioxide with a wave number of 300 at 2,349 one per centimeter. And uh, the second and more important molecule is, is the water. So we have the water vapor in the atmosphere, which is also able to um, absorb and emit uh, heat radiation. And the wave number of the isometric stretch of, of the water molecule is 3,756 one per centimeter. And uh, now what, what is important uh, to be, uh, in order to be able to absorb IR radiation, uh, the dipole moment of a molecule must change by the vibration. That is given uh, in these two um, vibrations, the asymmetric stretch of the uh, carbon uh, dioxide molecule and uh, the water molecule. Um, the overall dipole moment is changing. Of course, it is not necessary that the molecule has a permanent dipole because you see carbon dioxide has no permanent dipole. Um, if um, there is no movement of the atoms, uh, the overall dipole is, is, is zero. Uh, of course, we have a sub dipole so the, between the left hand side oxygen and the carbon. There's this dipole in on the right hand side as well. But the, the total dipole moment of uh, carbon dioxide is zero. Uh, of course, water has a permanent dipole as the hydrogen atoms are uh, positively charged and the uh, partial charge of the oxygen atom, of course, is, is negative. Um, and we have seen uh, using molecular mechanics, you can describe the vibrations and we can derive the wave numbers. Uh, what you can do, of course, is you can calculate uh, the wavelength. So what you can do is the wavelength of uh, the vibration is 2 pi over k and k is the wave number so you can derive the wavelength of this uh, vibrations uh, and the vibration of the asymmetric stretch of carbon dioxide is about let's say uh, so number is about um, 4257 uh, nanometers so we are in the mid IR wavelength the region. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the um, wave number of, of this asymmetric stretch of water gives us a wavelength of about uh, 2,662 uh, nanometers. So again, we are in the mid IR wavelength region. So both uh, vibrations are within the IR uh, radiation bandwidth and uh, this means that these molecules are able to absorb the IR radiation and they can uh, emit or they will emit uh, IR radiation. Molecules with just two atoms are not able to absorb IR radiation. They are not IR active. Uh, they have do not have a dipole moment which, which can change this is important as uh, nitrogen and oxygen, so the main compounds of the atmosphere, do not contribute uh, to the uh, absorption of heat radiation. 
uh, keep in mind nitrogen uh, with two atoms with a, a triple bond or two oxygen atoms which have a double bond um, there is no um, total dipole moment and of course uh, the vibration is uh, does not change the dipole moment of these of these molecules and this is um, necessary that these molecules are able to vibrate and to to absorb ir radiation and this is very important to understand because 78% uh, of the atmosphere is nitrogen and 21% uh, is oxygen um, so most of the uh, of the atmosphere consists of uh, molecules with just two atoms then we have uh, argon so that just one atom so this uh, can also not contribute to IR uh, radiation absorption. Um, so most parts or most molecules of the atmosphere cannot contribute to this absorption and cannot contribute to the greenhouse effect. Uh, and just the trace gases like uh, carbon dioxide, like water vapor, of course, we have uh, methane and nitrous oxide. These molecules have more than uh, two atoms, so at least three atoms, and they are uh, they have IR active vibrations, they can absorb the radiation um, and uh, after a while they can emit this, this radiation of course in all directions uh, into higher levels of the atmosphere but they also emit this uh, IR radiation back to Earth and we have seen in our uh, simplified uh, atmospheric model uh, talking about the energy balance that this absorption and emission of uh, of IR radiation gives us the additional uh, radiation we need to increase earth temperature from uh, minus 18 to plus uh, 15 degrees celsius so that is that's important and um, we, we get an additional radiation uh, of 150 watts per square meter which helps us to increase the temperature of earth and to get uh, liquid water to describe these uh, additional uh, force or additional radiation coming from the greenhouse gases um, is described as a radiative forcing, uh, abbreviated RF. So uh, this radiative forcing is the difference between the insulation which is absorbed by the Earth and the energy which is irradiated back uh, to space and is given in, in watts per square meter. Um, and of course, this imbalance of this um, radiation balance um, helps us to understand the change of climate parameters and uh, the changes in the uh, equilibrium of Earth, the uh, distribution of the equilibrium of um, the energy we get from the Sun and which uh, the energy which is emitted uh, by Earth. Uh, of course, an increase of this radioactive forcing leads to an increase of the temperature on the other hand, if the radiative forcing is reduced, uh, Earth would uh, cool down. And uh, this uh, definition of this radiative forcing helps us to understand uh, all the effects of climate change, the gl uh, global warming. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see um, the influences of the factors uh, provided by the IPCC uh, report from 2007. Um, what, what do we have? We have natural influences, of course, like uh, volcanoes or solar processes which influence uh, the, the atmosphere and the, uh, the radiation on Earth. On the other hand, of course, we have human activities like uh, burning fossil fuels and the emission of uh, uh, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Uh, of course, the land use also has an influence. And then we have direct and indirect climate change drivers, so the increase of greenhouse concentration in the atmosphere, the concentration of aerosols, and of course uh, the, the cloud, the formation of clouds in the atmosphere. Um, this gives us a radiative forcing, so an increase um, and decrease of additional uh, heat radiation and a change of the energy balance. Uh, and of course they are also non-initial radiative uh, effects and finally what we get is we get a, a perturbation and a response on these uh, forcing so there is a change in the temperature 
uh, of the atmosphere, a change of the temperature of, of the oceans. We have a change in the precipitation on, on Earth and all locations on Earth. And of course, there's a change in the vegetation on Earth uh, due to a higher uh, carbon dioxide concentration due to higher temperatures on Earth. And then we have, on the one hand, uh, biochemical feedback processes, which uh, uh, influence the climate change. Uh, and of course, uh, if we have a different land use, if you have uh, less uh, forests, uh, that, that gives us a, a new albedo or change the albedo that, that change the microclimate uh, condition in, in a region uh, and drives the climate change. And on the other hand, of course, uh, this the climate perturbation and response uh, has an influence on the human activities. Um, and then we have a close, we have two closed circles that this uh, uh, changes the climate um, faster or slower. Of course, that has happened, or this the circles has always happened. We have always had natural influences. We have had volcanoes, and you can absorb this in uh, understand this in, in the past and see this in the measurements that uh, higher volcano activity uh, gives us a higher concentration of, of aerosols or p small particles of the atmosphere covering this, the sunlight, covering the radiation, uh, which results in a reduction or a decrease of temperature. We've had uh, global cooling in the past periods of Earth. I think one important uh, incident was uh, the hit of this meteor and ending the age of dinosaurs. Uh, in the past 150 million years ago. Uh, on the other hand, uh, of course, uh, in modern times, the human activities lead to an increase of temperature. We burn uh, fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas, that gives us uh, uh, a higher uh, greenhouse gas concentration, and that drives uh, the, the, the climate to higher temperatures, to a change of precipitation, etc. The radiative forcing helps us to understand these um, rebound effects in the climate. Um, so let's have a look at the impact of the increase of greenhouse gas concentrations on the radiation balance. What we've seen is that a change in this radiative forcing leads to a changed radiation balance and a changed energy balance. And that gives us a feedback in the climate system, for example. Um, let's think about an increase of radiative forcing. What does we get? We get more water vapor in the air due to warning. <clears throat> so this is a positive effect if uh, we have higher temperatures and have more, more uh, wa water vapor in the air. Of course, uh, the more water is concentrated in the atmosphere, we have a change in cloud cover. That is a positive and a negative uh, feedback. And finally, what we get is we have a decrease in snow and ice cover. So that's again a positive effect. So increase the temperature as uh, we have more water due to the decrease of uh, uh, snow and, and ice. Um, of course, uh, the radiative forcing is the subject of considerable uncertainties. Uh, in particular, um, Science has to analyze and understand uh, the effects like aerosols on the radiation balance, which is uh, at the moment not fully quantified, but uh, we are getting uh, more and more information to understand better how these uh, um, effects contribute to the radiation balance and uh, to understand the feedback on the climate system. The global mean temperature change, uh, you can see this here with the delta T, uh, and the radiative forcing are F are linked by a uh, value called climate sensitivity lambda um, after a new uh, equilibrium is reached. So you see that this climate sensitivity lambda is described as the temperature change uh, over the radiative forcing. So what you can do is uh, you can describe this climate sensitivity as the ratio of this temperature increase, of course, also the temperature decrease of the surface divided by the effect of increased greenhouse gas concentrations um, expressed as an additional irradiance. Um, and we've seen this that the radiative forcing is a good first approximation uh, indicator of the resulting change of the global mean temperature 
uh, as we've seen, we have this positive and, ne and negative uh, rebound e uh, effects, which helps us to understand uh, the change of the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Uh, of course, uh, if we increase the greenhouse gases and uh, the concentration of aerosols, uh, this gives us a considerable disturbance of the radiation balance of the Earth's surface and, of course, the troposphere system. Uh, so what we need to understand and what we need to be able to derive by using uh, atmospheric physics um, is to understand how these uh, changes of concentrations influence the radiative forcing and what is, what is the feedback of the climate system. Um, and of course, uh, this radiative forcing of uh, the surface uh, troposphere system by a disturbance like, for example, the increase of the greenhouse gases um, gives us a change in the net radiation um, that would pass the troposphere uh, if the temperature and the state of the troposphere and the Earth's surface remain unchanged in an undisturbed state. So again, this helps us to understand what is happening, uh, happening in the um, lower and of course in the upper layers of the atmosphere's uh, parts, uh, like in the troposphere, of course, in the uh, stratosphere to the higher level. We need to, to understand the, the effects uh, that we have an increase of temperature in the higher levels of troposphere and a decrease of uh, temperature in the lower uh, levels of the uh, stratosphere um, to understand that uh, the Earth's surface uh, temperature is increasing. The IPCC report of 2013 uh, summarizes the effects on radiative forcing by different compounds. What you can see in this diagram are um, the, contribu the contribution to the radiative forcing by different compounds relative to the condition before the Industrial Revolution in 7050, given watts per square meter. So positive values uh, mean that we have a positive radiative forcing, we have an increased radiation, uh, positive feedback that gives us an increase of temperature. On the other hand, uh, if the radiative forcing is negative, that uh, has a negative feedback and reduces the temperature in the atmosphere. On the right hand side, the arrows represent the level of confidence. So um, are the effect or what is the quality of understanding uh, of these effects, um, and you see the main effects are, or most of the effects are well understood. There are some um, effects which have to uh, need to have more research, but overall, we have a high level of confidence of what is happening uh, in the Earth's uh, climate system. So, uh, first of all, you see uh, the greenhouse gases. We have already talked about carbon dioxide, uh, methane, halocarbons, and nitrous oxide. Uh, the length of these bars, uh, as I said, gives the radiative forcing. Uh, and this error bar shows the inaccuracy or, or of these uh, values. So you see the carbon dioxide concentration adds about two watts per square meter of radiative forcing uh, to the uh, Earth system. And this is very well understood. There is no um, misunderstanding that's uh, fully understood. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the effects of uh, carbon monoxide, NOx, and non-methane volatile organic compounds. Um, this is um, well, the, with a mean a level of confidence, uh, but these compounds just have a small positive or even a negative uh, contribution. Uh, and you see even the error bars are rather small. Then we have uh, the aerosols, we have the cloud adjustment, the albedo change due to land use. So we reduce, uh, we reduce the uh, um, albedo, so we, we have a less reflection of uh, solar radiation. Uh, you see this uh, gives us a negative uh, radiative forcing, we reduce uh, the radiative forcing, we reduce uh, the, uh, the temperature. Um, in, and in particular, the, the cloud uh, adjustment is not uh, understood that well. Uh, that is a rather complicated process in the atmosphere, uh, how the clouds adjust due to uh, changed uh, concentration of aerosols um, in the atmosphere. Um, but overall, you see here um, the overall radiative forcing on the one hand of first bar gives us the change radiative forcing in 1950 compared to 7050, then second bar 1980 to 7050, and then the situation today 
or in 2011 compared to 7050. And you see overall we have a change of radiative forcing of 2.3 watts per square meter with a high level of, of, of confidence. Of course, we have a wide uh, spread of inaccuracy um, due to the inaccuracy of coming from all compounds. But overall, it's well understood that we have a positive radiative forcing and a positive feedback. And that's the reason why we are sure that uh, these uh, compounds contribute to the global warming and the increase of uh, the global temperature. Next, we want to have a look at the carbon cycle. Uh, so the exchange of carbon in the Earth's system. We have uh, the atmosphere, we have uh, the oceans, of course we have the sediments, and of course we have uh, the biomass. Uh, on the one hand, what you can see on this um, figure um, with the data from the NASER Earth Observatory, you see on the one hand the amount of carbon uh, written in italics, so the atmosphere consists of 800 of gigatons of carbon. In, in the ocean we have close to the surface on the upper layer about 1000 gigatons of uh, uh, carbon, the deep ocean consists of uh, 37,000 gigatons of, uh, of carbon. Then we have the reactive sediments with 6,000 and in particular that's important fossil carbon that's about 10,000 gigatons of uh, carbon which is stored in, in fossil uh, fuels. And on the other hand we have uh, the flow of, of carbon given in gigatons per year. So uh, what we have is we have uh, the photosynthesis for example has uh, the plants with a biomass of 550 gigatons of carbon. Um, the, the photosynthesis absorbs about 120 gigatons per year. Uh, in red, these values are the, is the human influence, so uh, additional 3 gigatons of carbon is absorbed uh, due to photosynthesis by, by plants. On the other hand, we have plant respirization with uh, 60 gigatons per year, um, so the plants emit uh, carbon to the atmosphere. On the other hand, we have the air-sea uh, gas exchange with photosynthesis, so that's again more or less a closed circle with about 90 gigatons per year. Uh, and of course we have uh, this ocean sediments, the 2 gigatons per year of carbon is stored in, 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 in sediments in the deep ocean. And of course, this black, um, this black and white arrows represent the uh, natural circle without any disturbance by humans uh, or human activity. And this, of course, is a closed circle. Um, so we have uh, equilibrium and then constant, uh, rather constant conditions over uh, large time periods uh, within, uh, let's say, thousands of years. But now what we get is we have human emissions, uh, so we have nine gigatons of carbon which are emitted due to human activity by burning fossil fuel, by of course the change of land use. So we add nine gigatons of uh, carbon each year. Now, of course, this value is rather small compared to all the other carbon uh, flow values, but we do this continuously each year and disturb the closed circle. So we add more carbon uh, to the atmosphere that leads to a higher concentration of carbon uh, dioxide and methane and other uh, carbon-based molecules, and this leads to an increase of uh, greenhouse gas uh, gases in the atmosphere and increase of temperature. And so human activity disturbs this carbon cycle and leads to this uh, climate change and climate warming. Next, we want to have a look at the combined components of the global carbon budget as a function of time provided by Leclerc in this publication about global carbon budget in 2018. What you can see in this diagram um, are the are the compounds uh, like uh, the fossil CO2 emissions in gray uh, in, in, in each decade in the 60s, 1970s, 80s, etc. Uh, the changes uh, of the emission due to the land use. On the other hand, we have the terrestrial and the ocean sink, so reduction of uh, carbon uh, in the atmosphere. 
Um, then of course we have uh, we need to consider the budget imbalance and finally in red in this curve uh, in this diagram you see this red uh, curve representing the growth rate uh, in the atmospheric co2 concentration and all, all what you see is we have an increase of uh, fossil co2 emissions in uh, represented by the gray bars with the in the arrow bars marked with these um, in, in, in gray so you see we have this increase over the decades of the uh, CO2 emissions. On the other hand, the change of the land use keeps rather constant at about 1.3 to 1.5 uh, gigatons carbon per year. On the other hand, we have an increase of uh, terrestrial sink and ocean sink in, in orange and in blue. So there's an uh, increase of the sink value um, with uh, in total about uh, let's say th six gigatons of carbon uh, per year but overall we have an increase of uh, carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere and that gives us an increase uh, of, of the radiative force and thus leads uh, to a global warming now we've understood how the greenhouse effect goes on, which components contribute to the greenhouse effect, what's, uh, what is important. Um, and next we want to have a look at who's responsible for the greenhouse gas emissions, the CO2 emissions. Uh, this diagram uh, with data uh, from uh, the website Our World and Data provides information about the annual global CO2 emissions uh, by the world region since 1850, so um, mid of the 19th century. Um, what you can see is on the x-axis you, you see the time, the y-axis gives us the annual CO2 emissions in, in gigatons, uh, so in billion tons. And what you see is, uh, on the one hand, of course, the beginning was in Europe, and in, in blue you see uh, that uh, represents the European Union, um, that's uh, Germany, uh, United Kingdoms, uh, of course, uh, France, so the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, in particular the United Kingdom, uh, which is uh, counted to uh, the European countries. And you see United States with the uh, end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, with the increase of the industrial development and a fast increase of uh, their global, uh, their annual CO2 emissions. Um, what you also can see is that China has uh, today uh, the largest contribution, the largest share with um, the beginning of this uh, uh, century with a fast increase uh, of uh, the emissions due to the industrial development. And you see all the other countries, of course, um, show a similar development with the beginning or the, in the mid of the 20th century. Uh, and then, of course, a uh, continuous increase of CO2 emissions, though, that at the moment we have uh, overall uh, about uh, 36 to 37 uh, gigatons of CO2 emissions uh, globally. Now we want to have a look at where does these uh, carbon dioxide emissions come from. So what are the fuel types, the fossil fuels, which... Uh, emit uh, carbon dioxide again you see the time period or the period from 8050 uh, up to now and you see the co2 emissions in gigatons on the y-axis uh, of course in the beginning um, of the industrial revolution you see in black that is coal so you the use of coal to drive the machines uh, to generate electricity the coal was the main fuel in the 19th century and in the until the mid of the 20th century then in the beginning of the 20th century you see in in, in gray that's uh, the use of oil um, to uh, in the transportation sector uh, to get heat for uh, in particular so it was a cheap uh, and high efficient uh, fuel uh, to, to drive machines um, then on the second place, we have the natural gas in, 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 in yellow. So with the mid of the 20th century, we have a fast increase of uh, CO2 emissions by natural gas. Uh, then uh, in the end of the 20th century, we have this uh, cement injury. So the, the production of cement uh, emits a lot of carbon dioxide. Uh, that's uh, up to now uh, 
small but important share and finally we have this flaring so again uh, one small share of co2 emissions at the moment uh, you see coal is again uh, has the highest share um, due to the use of hard coal uh, in particular in asia and china uh, in coal power plants to uh, burn coal and generate electricity um, so coal is uh, the, has the largest contribution, second oil, and then on the third place, uh, natural gas. Uh, these are the fuels which uh, in, are responsible for the carbon dioxide emissions globally. One interesting issue is the responsibility of uh, different countries uh, regarding the greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere and the emission coming from different uh, countries. What you can see in this diagram is uh, are the values of the cumulative CO2 emissions since 1850. So you see the period uh, on the x-axis and the cumulative CO2 emissions in gigatons on the y-axis. Of course, the beginning of the CO2 emissions can be found in the United Kingdom with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in the 18th uh, century. Um, and then in the beginning of the 19th and the, the beginning of the 20th century, you see the increase of cumulative CO2 emissions in the United States due to their fast industrial development. In yellow, um, you see the emissions of, of Germany, of course, one important industrial country with their continuous increase of greenhouse gas emissions and the total contribution. And overall, you see uh, Germany is on a higher level, although Germany is a rather small country compared to the other countries like United States or, or China. Um, and then, of course, what you see is this fast increase of this cumulative CO2 emissions of China. So due to the fast development in the end of the 20th and the beginning of the 21st century, they use fossil fuel to drive the industry. Uh, they emit a lot of uh, greenhouse gases. And today they are on the second place regarding the cumulative CO2 emissions. Uh, annually they are on the first place, so China emits the most uh, or the largest amount of greenhouse gases. Um, and cumulative uh, over uh, the time you see the China is even on the second place uh, with one half of the uh, cumulative CO2 emissions. Um, compared to the United States. You see Russia, uh, Japan, France, India, which in, in orange uh, show also a fast increase uh, due to their in industrial development. So overall, what you can derive from this diagram is so which countries are responsible. Of course, at the moment, China has a significant contribution to greenhouse gas emissions and is responsible for the largest amount per year. Uh, the United States has, of course, or they have a large responsibility uh, due to global warming as they have emitted the most greenhouse gases, but also a smaller uh, industrial countries like United Kingdom, Germany, France, Canada, Japan, Russia are responsible, so they have to, uh, to work on climate change to reduce the emissions and to find a solution to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions because they have emitted a lot of greenhouse gases and are responsible for the global warming we are observing at the moment. If you take a look at the greenhouse gas emissions of carbon dioxide equivalents by sector in 1990 and 2016, we can see how the different uh, sectors contribute to the greenhouse gas emissions. What you do is we, we take a look at the carbon dioxide equivalents in this case so we also um, take a look or consider uh, methane nitrous oxide etc um, and calculate their influence on the greenhouse effects that we can talk about uh, carbon dioxide equivalents on the left hand side you see the situation uh, in 1990 with uh, 35 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalents uh, emissions and the situation in 2016 can be seen on the right hand side with 49.4 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent uh, emission. What you see is on the one hand uh, about uh, one, half, uh, one quarter of the emissions um, are coming from the agriculture and the land use change and the forestry. Uh, in 1990 this share has slightly been reduced um, today. 
And on the other hand, of course, the manufacturing processes, so the energy used for manufacturing industrial processes, the transportation sector and the electricity and heat sector, they show the largest share as we use coal, natural gas uh, for electricity and heat production and uh, the transportation sector uses oil as a fossil fuel uh, and emits a lot of greenhouse gases. So overall, you see um, that the share has even increased with 30% uh, electricity and heat, 60% uh, transportation sector and 12% of the manufacturing energy. Uh, and even the industrial processes uh, additional uh, at six uh, percent of uh, CO two equivalents to the emissions of greenhouse gases. So overall, we need to work on these sectors and reduce the greenhouse gas emissions in these sectors and uh, to transform these sectors to uh, green and renewable uh, sources that we can reduce uh, the greenhouse gas emissions in in particular in these sectors. And finally, uh, what we can have a look at is what are the CO2 emissions per capita compared to the GDP, so the gross domestic product uh, per capita in 2016. What you can see on the x-axis, you see the CO2 emissions per capita in tons uh, of uh, selected countries. And on the y-axis, we have the gross domestic product in US dollars per capita. And uh, the size of these uh, circles represent uh, the, the, the population. So the larger the circle is, the, the higher the popula population is. So what you see on one hand, uh, the largest uh, CO2 emissions per capita can be seen in, in Australia, the United States, with about 16 to 17 tons of CO2 emissions per capita. Uh, then you have uh, Russia, Japan, uh, and, and, and Germany which are in the, in the range of 9 to, let's say, 12 tons of CO2 emissions per capita, so, so large values. Then we have China, which have reached about 7 uh, tons of CO2 emissions per capita. And you have to keep in mind, due to the large population, they, they contribute uh, to what the contribution of China to the global CO2 emissions is, uh, as we have a a large uh, value of emissions per capita and a high population gives us a very large total uh, CO2 emission. And finally, see these emerging countries uh, like Indonesia, like uh, Egypt, Brazil, uh, India, and Nigeria. Of course, these countries are emerging countries. They, their do gross domestic product is rather small in the range of five to 15,000 US dollars per capita. Um, and of course, what you have to keep in mind, they are emerging, so they will increase probably their uh, use of fossil fuel and thus their, their greenhouse gas emissions. If they reach a higher industrial um, and gross domestic product level, they will increase their emissions like the other countries. But you have to keep in mind, this, the countries have a, a larger population compared to the, let's call them the old industrial countries like United Kingdom, Japan, Germany. Uh, and Australia, so um, they will have a higher influence, the higher contribution. Uh, of course, overall, we need to, to change uh, the, the the use of fossil fuels. We have to reduce uh, the CO2 emissions per capita by the use of uh, greenhouse gas emission free uh, energy sources like renewables, wind, photovoltaics, hydropower, for example. Um, and of course, we need to be more efficient in the use of, of the energy sources uh, to reduce the emissions significantly um, without a loss of uh, the industrial level, without the loss of the GDP. Um, and that, that, that's the task for the next years and decades that, that we transform our energy system without a change of our um, uh, life quality.